Michael Palin, comedian, actor, writer, and presenter. In the mid-1960s, he was a founder member of the groundbreaking comedy troupe, Monty Python. Remarkable bird, the Norwegian blue. Beautiful plumage, isn't it? Whose television series and subsequent films drew both acclaim and controversy for their anarchic humor. He's also taken on serious acting roles, often playing affable yet complex characters. We have to behave with dignity and with honor, and above all, without corruption. <laughs> and has become known for his globe-trotting as a presenter of many travel series. I'm standing on the top of the world. In this episode of This Cultural Life, the Radio 4 programme, Michael Palin reveals his formative influences and experiences and how it was at university that he first saw a future for himself as a performer. This completely changed my life because there I was with a slight worry about performing in front of large audiences, performing to full houses every night. Suddenly there was a little glimpse that perhaps there was a future in just writing and doing comedy. to bang your head on. Yeah, we have a grand piano if you'd like to entertain us. A grand piano, yes. I can open it, but I couldn't play it. <laughs> Michael Palin, welcome to This Cultural Life. Thank you. You were born in Sheffield in 1943. What are your earliest memories of childhood, home life? Um, I think it was shopping in the, uh, the ration book era. Um, and I can remember going with my mother to get, I think we were given free orange juice at that time. It really, it must have been now, it must have been three or four. And watching it being filled up and handed over. Your father was an engineer in the Sheffield steel industry. Yeah. Um, what sort of man was he? What was he like? He was, he was quite a difficult man, in a way. He, he was a little bit sort of, could be quite cantankerous. And I think a lot of this went down to the fact he had a stammer all his life. And he was a man with a good sense of humour, but probably unable to tell jokes because of the stammer. So I think there was a, a, bit, a bit of frustration there. And did his stammer make him angry? I, I think it did make him angry at times, yes. I say he was a bit, bit short-tempered. And my mother, who must have lived with it all her, yeah, well, her adult life, was very good, just <laughs> carried on doing whatever had to be done. She, was, um, she had a terrific sort of practical, pragmatic functional way of doing things, but was, was lovely and funny too, so you know, mm. there we were. Many years later, you played a man in a film called A Fish Called Wanda. Yes. A man with a severe stammer. Yes. Were you drawing on your father then, consciously? Oh, yes. I, um, John Cleese had asked me if I, very early on, he was writing this um, heist movie, and one of the people in the gang had vital information, also had a stammer, which is, of course, you know, whatever you may think, that's a, it's a very funny idea. Do you know where they've gone? Uh, yeah. Fine, fine, yeah. where? The car. The car? Hotel. Uh, hotel? Which hotel? The car. The car. The car. The car. The car. And he said, oh, look, I want the stammer to be to sound right and realistic. And, and he said, I, he knew my father. And he said, can you, can you sort of deliver that? And I said, well, yeah, I think I could. And I, I wanted to make sure that the stammer wasn't a sort of ba 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 da 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 da, -da um, comic stammer, but just a kind of frustration when you have very important things to say. And this John, the other said, yes, come on, come on. Sorry, I'm sorry. Was your father still alive when the film came out? No, no, he, I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done it. Mm. I wouldn't have done it if he'd still been alive. It would have just been a bit too, too painful. Mm. What sort of cultural upbringing did you have at home? Was it an artistic household? Musically, yes. My father played the piano a lot um, and big stuff and Bach and all that sort of stuff before supper. 
it was a fairly sort of um, conventional middle-class household. A few books, but not a lot. I loved reading, and I actually used to go to the Sheffield City Library with my father, and he would go upstairs and I'd go downstairs to the children's library, and I just thought that was absolutely wonderful. And what about your mum's influence? What was, it, what was her influence on your creative imagination? She was just very sympathetic to anything new. If I wanted to tell her a story about something, she'd listen rather than be too busy. Uh, she was very nice that way, <laughs> indulged me probably a little bit and was very encouraging about my work at school. I can remember, I remember it was my father used to go, he was a bell ringer at the local church. So he'd go down and do bell ringing on Friday night and that was a bit of a relief because it was out of the house and we could do... And I remember my mother was so... She was so indulgent. She, I would read Shakespeare plays <laughs> to her, playing all the characters. At and, home? Yes, yes. And um, she, she never told me to stop, <laughs> uh, which is just nice. She made me feel I could sort of express myself at home in a way which my father wouldn't have had the patience to allow. And when you were reading those characters, I presume they came with voices and distinct characteristics then, did they? Oh, yes, yeah. I was a terrible old ham. That was, that was your first experience of performance then, I guess? Uh, uh, yes, I was in a couple of plays at school. I was a little nervous about acting in front of an audience. It was mm. a different sort of experimenting on, on characters and parts for my mother on a Friday night, but... but uh, it was much later on that I actually sort of became comfortable in front of audiences. Taking back to home life, mid-50s, what about radio comedy? How important was that? Radio comedy was very important in our family. and It was a nice thing. We could, all of us, my mum, my dad and me, and my sister, if she was back from work, would, would sit around and listen to Much Binding in the Marsh, um, programmes like that, and there was a real... We could all enjoy that. It was one of the few things that, as a family, we just all enjoyed. On the other hand, The Goon Show, which I really, really liked, I could only listen to on my own. Even my mother was Goon Show proof. My father thought the, you know, the radio had broken when he came in and said, <laughs> like that, you know? <laughs> he couldn't understand it at all, at all. Eh? Who is it? <laughs> How many story ones do we break it down so I haven't helped me around even breathe? However, did you get a name like that? <laughs> I have influence. Open up, Mr. Crun. It's me, Eccles. Oh, Eccles, it's me, Mr. Crun. Oh, Mr. Crun, it's me, Eccles. <laughs> the Goon Show was actually the first time when I discovered something on my own. Of course, my friends at school, some of them absolutely loved it. Not all of them. Oh, really? People who couldn't suspend their sort of uh, seriousness um, found it quite hard. Well, what's the point of it and all that? And I said, well, there's no point. That's the point. <laughs> it's interesting, though, the, with the absurdity and the surrealism, the goons were clearly paving the way for Python. Did you end up working with, with Spike Milligan ever? Yes. Um, we did, I did end up getting to know Spike quite well, which was an extraordinary thing, really. And, in fact, I did a, um, a programme for the BBC called Comic Roots when they, they filmed a sort of a, your, your childhood influences. <laughs> right. And in one of them, I, um, I asked Spike if he'd come along and sit with me in a room, which is sort of designed like our house at home. And I got the same radio, huge, great radio with three valves, which I used to, to listen to the Goon Show on. This is the BBC Light Programme, and candidly, I'm fed up with it. <laughs> and just and, and play a bit of goons together, and I, I could not quite believe what was actually happening. Here was Spike in the room, you know, and we just played a little bit. Spike, I live for the show. I mean, that the, the, the day of the week so when I had the goon show kept me going for, for the, the entire week. But did you know by letters or any feedback at all that there was this generation growing up who, who'd been totally liberated by the No, the BBC by the show. kept... The kept England secret from us, totally. <laughs> we had a good summer. Yeah. That's how it was. I thought it was very nice, because, you know, Spike was a little bit on the mm. manic-depressive side. Mm. He found it very hard work, writing these brilliant scripts that we all laughed at. Mm. So one good summer was... I know what he meant, you know. You look back nostalgically and say, ah, oh, everything was just perfect. 
And of course it wasn't if you were writing it, it was bloody hard work. That's a lovely phrase, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. On this culture of life, I asked my guests to choose the most important influences and experiences that have inspired their own creativity. And the first moment that you've chosen, Michael, is meeting Terry Jones in 1962 at Oxford University. Yeah. Um, how did you meet Terry? It was the first day there, and there was a man called Robert Hewison who thought he was very funny. And I thought, come on, I'm the funny one. <laughs> I tell the jokes here, but Robert was very funny too. So, and we, we shared a, a love of the goon shows and Peter Sellers and all that. And he said, you know, what we've got to do is, is sort of do a comedy act together. And also you can get money, you get £30 a night if you're doing cabaret at a big party. Big money. Mean, yeah. Big money, very big money then. And maybe it was three pounds, I can't remember. <laughs> there was a three in it somewhere. Anyhow, um, what Robert did and what was so important was that he moved me away from, I suppose, the sort of career path that my father was kind of thinking of me doing, mm. public school, playing sports, getting a good job as a sort of, you know, um, doctor or manager or something like that. I met other actors and other writers. And the most important um, uh, meeting I had, of course, was Terry Jones. Um, and uh, Terry and I got on very, very well right, right from the start. And he was, he was a marvellous performer and very, very bright. I was chosen in 1964 to be a part of the Oxford University Review at the Edinburgh Festival. Terry was in the review as well. This completely changed my life because there I was with a slight worry about performing in front of large audiences, performing to full houses every night. The review was very, very popular. David Frost came to, to see us, you know, some talent spotting and all that. Who would have been a massive star at the time, because yes, he, yes. Was, he was hosting... That was the week that, that was. That was the week that was at that time. Yes. Were you aware that Frost was in the audience? That's, oh, yes, yes. I suddenly realised that there was a possibility of my using the things I could really do fairly well, which was sort of tell stories, um, make people laugh um, and, you know, act characters. Suddenly there was a little glimpse that perhaps there was a future in just writing and doing comedy. So that was why, I mean, and, and that's the way I went in the end. You mentioned David Frost coming to see you that night. Um, it was probably a couple of years later that you ended up writing for David Frost on yeah. The Frost Report. So this is one of your first jobs in television mm. and put you in the room with Terry Jones, but also with John Cleese and Graham Chapman as well. And Eric Idle. And Eric Idle. So how do you go from Frost Report uh, alongside your, your future Monty Python teammates to actually forming Python? I mean, how was it commissioned? Cleese rang me up in, in um, I think it would be 1969, April or something like that, and said, look, we, we've enjoyed... There was a series that um, uh, I'd done with Terry and, and David Jason and Eric Idle called Do Not Adjust Your Set, mm. which is for, for children. I'm the fantastic Eric Idle. I'm the short David Jason. I'm the violent Michael Palin. I'm the round and cuddly Terry Jones. <laughs> John said, you know, we like what you're doing. And I said, I love what, what you're doing. He said, shall we get together? Let's do something that's fresh and different and new. That was the basis on which we started, which was to try and carry on the evolution, if you like, without sounding too pompous, of, of television comedy. Mm. by using film cleverly, by, by um, doing away with sketches that have to have a, a punchline, uh, and generally shaking it all up, you know, being quite disorderly. And that's what Python really was. I cut down trees, I skip and jump, I like to press wildflowers. I put on women's clothing and hang around in bars. I cut down trees, he skips and jumps, he likes to press wildflowers. I mean, people say, oh, it's very, very rude and disgusting and all that sort of thing, which it wasn't really. It was just disorderly uh, in, terms <laughs> of, in terms of comedy. Yeah. yeah, and we had Gilliam, of course, by that time, Terry Gilliam, terribly important mm. uh, in uh, the bringing that quality of the animation mm. 
very sharp, very, very funny, very, very good. So we were able to experiment. How did it work in the writer's room then with suddenly this, this group of people um, who were coming from different comic perspectives? Was there a, a kind of a creative hierarchy? Um, well, the perspectives were not that different, really. We'd all played to little university audiences. We'd honed our, our material quite well, so mm. there was a certain similarity there. Gilliam was a sort of wild card. And in the writing, it was very democratic. We would discuss silly ideas, have a morning of silly ideas, which was just great. And someone would have to write them all down, and then at the end of the morning, you'd say, well, you go and write that, and I'll go and write this. And we'd, we'd go away and write in our separate groups, Terry, Terry and myself, um, Graham and John, Eric on his own. But characters were always important for you, and it's interesting thinking back to the series uh, and also the films, Life of Brian and the Holy Grail. Your characters are often mild-mannered, they're polite, frustrated. Were you channelling aspects of your own character into those characters, do you think? <laughs> Probably. I could do them, that's all I can say. I could do shopkeepers very well. <laughs> and John and I did a lot of shopkeeper mm. material, and I could be the boring shopkeeper who claimed his cheese shop was the best in the country and it had none, none of the cheeses that John <laughs> asked for and he asked for about 50 cheeses Do you have Emmental? No In a Norwegian Jarlsberger? No Lipta? No Lancashire? No White Stilton? No Danish Blue? No Double Gloucester? No No, no, no Oh, yeah, yeah, you got Camembert Rest Bleu, Pelle de Champagne Camembert. Oh, we do have some camembert. You do. Excellent. Oh, no, the cat's eaten it. Sorry. So I could play in partnership with John, with John's sort of aggression and impatience. Getting increasingly uh, irate. Yes, getting increasingly irate in a very funny way. <laughs> and me being rather difficult and, 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 and impeding his sort of whatever he was trying to do. That worked very well. It's also about affability, isn't it? It's a kind of recurring trait of so many of the characters. And that really is you. I mean, there's, is there anybody that's got yeah. a bad word to say about Michael Palin? You are famously <laughs> the nicest man in Britain. Grr, oh, grr, grr. Now's the time to change that. Come on, no, what, what, I, what I, makes I, you angry? I what see, makes you angry? Well, uh, you know, lots of things make me angry. <laughs> you know, but they're, they're tiny things like everybody else finds. You know, people who drive right very close behind you on the motorway, people who throw litter out of car windows, silly things like that. But generally speaking, I find you get far more out of people. We've got to know each other and, and, and being responsive to other people. Mm. It's very much about giving and taking and not being the one who is the star or has to be this or that. Did the comedy ever become competitive in the writing room with Python? Was it fractious as well? Well, like every bit of creative work, of course, there are fractures. I mean, I, with Terry, I didn't always agree. Um, that's not the way to produce good material. I've got to have someone saying, that's not funny, this is. But there are definitely, you know, uh, there are other things that we wrote sometimes that they, that John and Graham and Eric didn't like and, and vice versa. That competition was very, very important. Mm. But in the end, I think we all knew if it was funny and made people laugh, then that was probably OK. And we set our standards fairly high. You wouldn't think so from looking at some of the Python material. Dreadful, but generally, we set our standard fa fairly high. Always look on the bright side of death. <whistles> Just before you draw your terminal breath. <whistles> and when it was good, it was great, and it was breaking new ground. It brings to mind... There was a late-night discussion show in 1979, I think it was called Friday Night, Saturday Morning, in oh, which yeah. you sat alongside John Cleese and had to defend the life of Brian yes. film yeah. against this, this sort of complaint that it was sacrilegious, laid by, I think it was yeah. the Bishop of Southwark and Malcolm, Malcolm Muggeridge. Malcolm Muggeridge, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. All you've done is well, to make a lot of people on a cross singing a music, a, a, a music hall song. <laughs> and, and a lot of I mean, people, it's so disgusting when you think that, of it. If you films, wanted to make a joke out of Jesus, Jesus would have appeared on the cross. He was an actor, he was there in the film, mm. he does not appear on no, the cross. But you, Nowhere you make... at all. It's a gang of thieves, of common criminals, yes. who were at that time crucified in hundreds day by day. I mean, that's... I'm, I'm sorry, I know Could... that you think I'm wrong, but that's what I feel. Well, I think... Is that the closest we've come to see you riled in public, do you think? Well, people do, do are quite surprised. They said, oh, you look really angry. I said, well, yeah, I do get angry. It was because the 
the, the, the two people representing, if you like, the conventional religious view, that this was a film of making fun of Jesus, which, mm. of course, it wasn't. But, you know, that, 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 they, all our protestations were dismissed, you know, because they knew they were the people from the religious hierarchy. There's nothing in this little squalid number that could possibly uh, affect any, anybody. Now, in that sense, I give you Might this point. Not, I give I you this think. point that there's nothing in this film that could possibly destroy anybody's genuine faith. Nope, no, that I no, grant you no, absolutely, absolutely not, right. uh, because it's much too tenth rate for that. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> It was a key moment, I think, in, in broadcasting, I don't think it's too great thing to say, when suddenly the establishment was seen to have got it wrong mm. and they thought they'd got it right because he was a bishop, Malcolm Muggeridge had long a broadcaster and writer of great experience, very intelligent and intellectual, and these two, Cleese and Paley, had just had done a silly film about religion. I got it completely wrong and the audience <laughs> knew that by the end. But it's landmark television, isn't it? Because it is, it is as landmark. you say, it's a moment in which there is a kind of... A, there's a change there, there's a social yes. change, the change in terms of the morality yes. as well that is, is being challenged. Yeah. Uh, there were so many great Monty Python sketches and scenes in those films. Can you bring it down to one? Do you have a favourite Monty Python moment? Yes, I do. It's the fish slapping dance, which is a very, very small... It uh, lasts about a minute just involved me and John, you know, sort of by, by the side of the water and the canal side. And the music plays... Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> and I go up and slap John on the face with his two little pilchers. Doo -doo 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 -doo. And I slap him a few times, knowing that the, uh, this was great, John was getting quite angry at being slapped at fish. <laughs> and then we bow, and then he picks up this enormous fish, a pike, and wax me on the head and I fall in the water. <laughs> what worked so well was that it, it was a lock at Teddington and the lock was full of water. When we actually did it, um, the water had been drained out. <laughs> you fall and quite it a long way. Yeah, it's about 15 foot drop and it's a very good fall. And it's, I, I tell you, that works anywhere on the planet. Your next choice for This Cultural Life is the 1991 Channel 4 television drama, GBH, yeah. written by Alan Bleasdale, yeah. in which you starred alongside Robert Lindsay. Um, uh, it's a serious drama about political extremism, about power, about local politics, and therefore, in a way, new creative territory for you at the time. Throughout my life, I've enjoyed doing different things and, and, and taking on different challenges. I think that's what keeps you fresh. Mm. Um, but anyway, th this this came rather out of the blue. So to get the call from Alan Bleasdale, he wanted you to play one of the two leading roles. Um, it was a it was a sort of recognition of 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 uh, an acting talent which I hoped I could live up to. I mean, I'd I'd done lots of acting, and, and people tend to forget, you know, that Python you do in a Python film, you play twelve parts, mm. and you have to play them very quickly. You have to get the essence of them very quickly. But this was a very different sort of thing. And I, I remember thinking, when I was offered it, this is huge, you know, and, and can I do something like this? And it was just one of the, the most um, um, rewarding piece of, of, of acting I've ever done. You're playing Jim Nelson, who yeah. is a headmaster of a school who is brought into conflict with the sort of preening, narcissistic and corrupt leader of a city council in the north of England. Jim, isn't it? To some. Not all. Pleased to meet you. This is a school. You're not a member of this school. I'd like you to leave. Oh, come on, Jim. You know who I am. It wouldn't interest me if you were Bishop Tutu wearing one. I think playing um, Jim Nelson brought things out of me that I'd never brought out before. And, I, I mean, I, 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 it's part of the reason why I haven't done much acting since, because it was such a good and important series, such a significant series, demanding so much of all of us who were in it. Well, about 25 years after GBH, you were in The Death of Stalin, the Armando yes. Iannucci, yes. black comedy, which is delivered with serious intent. I mean, yes. It's a very funny film, but, I mean, arguably that is a kind of continuation of the same 
style of acting, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Well, I, I played Molotov as this sort of slightly put upon character. I mean, though he was the foreign minister and all that sort of thing. Stalin and Beria put you on a list. Stalin? Oh, I must have wronged him so badly. What did I do? Oh, no, nothing. Don't you see? Beria, he wants you out. Now, I've been talking with Comrade Bulganin. No, no. This I think he's right. We can outvote no, them. No, no, no. This is factionalism, Nikki. No, no, it's Stalin not. didn't like oh, factionalism. Oh, Stalin is dead! He was the arch-loyalist, was he? He was the, he was the arch-loyalist, who was very, very devious and nasty, but also kind of um, loved his wife and all that sort of stuff, um, <laughs> even though he put her in prison. I can't believe he's gone. Oh... <sighs> have to wait for it to fill up. It was comedy, it was brilliant comedy, with a very serious sort of underbelly to it. The next big chapter of your life, your third act in a way, is as a global traveller when you embarked on Around the World in 80 Days. Were you a keen traveller anyway? Um, I wanted to be. I didn't, I hadn't travelled a lot, um, because when we were young, the, the idea of going on holidays abroad didn't happen. There wasn't enough money. Mm. Uh, if you're living in Sheffield, you didn't go off to the Costa Brava then. You, you went to Skegness or somewhere, or we went, we went to Norfolk. I loved the idea of exotic places. I wanted to see the Nile, I wanted to cross the equator, I wanted to see the North and South Poles. Ridiculous things like that you have when you're young, and you know it'll never happen. And yet it did. And yet it did, it did in the end. Um, Travelling around the world, you know, with the BBC paying. Um, wonderful. Of all the many places that you visited in those series, is, is there one place that sticks in your mind that you're particularly fond of? The northwest frontier in, in Pakistan was... I think that was the best show we ever did, partly because we were, we were warned not to go there at that time. We were told, you know, it's very, very dangerous. I can remember having to do a piece to camera there, and I thought, this is it, this is it, this is what, what making travel programmes are about. I'm at the top of the Khyber Pass, on the border between Pakistan and out there, Afghanistan. Through here have come some of the great armies of the world. Alexander the Great brought an army through here. I'm an absolutely sort of pivotal point of the, of the world, you know. And I thought, well, yeah, it doesn't get better than this. What drives you on creatively? <laughs> and I'm presuming yeah. that it hasn't come to an end. Manic egotism. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I've enjoyed nearly everything I've done. I had some things that have not worked, but I've enjoyed most things I've done. And, and building on that is, is part of what I, I, I really enjoy. So, uh, you know, as long as I can, I will I'll, I'll use that, that sort of my... my Good help, mm. touch wood, um, to do, to carry on being able to travel if I can or just or right. I mean, there are a lot of options open. The secret is to keep busy, isn't it? It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, very much so. Mm. You lost your wife, Helen, last year. Yeah. I know you'd been together mm. since you were teenagers. Yeah, yeah. How have you been, Michael? Well, it's not easy. It's, just, it's an unreal world you enter. You know, someone who you've been with for so long and every reference point in your life is sort of connected with with that person. Um, and and suddenly they're not there. And you, you kind of fool yourself um, that they are there. You know, I haven't changed much in the house and all that. The family has still come round. We have, you know, birthday parties and all that, which Helen would have been part of. And, and it's kind of... Dealing with the uh, foreverness of it, you know, that it's forever. Mm. Michael Palin, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. For sharing your cultural life with us. Thanks. Join Michael Palin on his travels around the world in 80 days while adventure awaits in Himalaya. Watch on BBC iPlayer.